And I'm going to talk about buying a yacht on eBay and sailing down the intercoastal waterway on the east coast of the US. But first, a bit about me. I started sailing in the 1950s as crew on yacht deliveries, the most dangerous form of sailing in my view. Early and late winter sailing, cold, foul weather and boats with a lot of problems. You learn to cope. Emigrated to South Africa in 1964 and sailed 505's contender and crewed on Flame Lily, a 40-foot sloop on Lake Kariba, which is 200 miles long and 40 miles wide, a big puddle. Started to build a 40-foot ferro yacht in Joburg, but got married instead. Left Rhodesia in 1980 with nothing and returned to the UK and struggled for 10 years with little sailing. In 1990, I bought Emma from Jim Cricket a 24-foot circa 1870 gaffer that lay opposite the knottage with the spring tides running through her. Motored her up to Alsford and got her out before she sank in the creek. Rebuilt her that winter and sailed in the Shotley Classic Boat Festival the next year. This is an amazing result here. This tiny little gaff rigger, Emerald Bosom, she's well up with the, with the Hot shot the Mutants. Emma, she carried off the point series for the fastest gaff boat, very deservedly. And for the next seven years, sailed and won races from Lowestoft to the Swale. I still have her at Alsford, waiting for a younger enthusiast to take her on. She is the image of Peter Sainty's Vigia, built in 1874, which is now in Cowles Maritime Museum. In 1998, I bought the hulk of the 44-foot smack Alberta CK318 in Faversham, and Ed Halsall's smack Pertwee CK77 towed her back to Brightlingsea one cold November night, got her sailing, no engine, and had a lot of fun with her. Then in 2002 accepted an offer I couldn't refuse and her new owner had her rebuilt at Hollowshaw and she now wins all the prizes. While I was sailing and working on my old gaffers I did quite a few yacht deliveries and one 40-foot yacht, the Ketch Alma, I got to know very well. We delivered her from Fleetwood, Lancashire to Walton and had the usual dramas, had some great sails in her from Falmouth to Spain, Portugal to the Canaries, and in 2004 from Nisner Lagoon, South Africa, to the Caribbean via the Royal Yacht Club Cape Town, Jamestown Bay, St. Helena, where Napoleon died, and the black-skinned locals have names like Smith, Jones and Robinson, lovely people. Fernando de Noronha, a tropical paradise, three days sail off the South American coast and mainland Brazil. Then picking up a passenger in the ITCZ and 17 days later to Tobago. Developed the twizzle rig for downwind trade wind sailing on the way into the ultimate easy running rig. But that's another story. I've heard about the intercoastal waterway down the east coast of America and thought it would be an interesting experience. Boats in America can be very cheap, not in pristine condition, so I did some research about a Brit buying a boat in the US and found it possible, no legislation preventing it. I thought a four-berth, 40-foot motorboat with a 30-horsepower diesel would be ideal but they don't seem to exist in the US. 28 to 30 foot motor sailors like Fishers or Watsons are very rare. Twin V8 sport fishing boats are 10 a penny. Very cheap to buy, but cost $80 an hour to, in fuel to run. However, plenty of small sailing cruisers available in the States. Boats can be donated to charity for a tax deduction and together with bank repossessions can be a bargain. Most are put on websites or eBay for sale. So my specifications for a boat 
was 28 to 32 feet, under 5 foot draft, a good diesel, roller furling jib, autopilot and GPS map plotter, a tender and an outboard. The first boat I bid and won on eBay turned out to be very different from the description. I complained to the selling charity and eventually got my $700 deposit back. About the same time, an old Bristol 30 that fitted my specification went for $4,100 on eBay. Ten days later, it was up for auction again, the previous bidder not coming up with the money, a common problem on eBay. The bidding was at 3000 for most of the auction duration, so I emailed the Sea Scouts and asked what their buy-it-now price would be, and they replied $4,100. Deal, I said, and paid $500 deposit by PayPal, and I paid the balance by PayPal within five days, making the total in sterning £2,580. They also agreed that storage at the marina would be free for about a month, as it was their berth, or slip, as they call it in the States. I flew to JFK, New York on the 2nd of October, and arrived by train at New London, Connecticut, the next day. I was met at the station by the U.S. Sea Scout skipper, who drove me to the marina and let me on board to sleep the night. He quickly ran through the boat, and was dismayed that the engine wouldn't start. The electric winch didn't work either. Strange, he said. They were fine the other day. Yeah, I thought, I've heard that before. What will I find next? Well, what I found next was that the holding tank had backed up and overflowed through the heads and left a smelly brown puddle on the floor. Yuck! I'll tackle that problem tomorrow. There followed 12 days intensive fitting out. Luckily, most days were warm and dry, and the yard staff were terrific. The engine wouldn't start because the control panel wiring loom was disconnected. Push the plug in, and the engine ran sweet as a nut. The gearbox control lever only engaged reverse and neutral. The clamp holding the cable end was too loose. Insert some packing, and the gearbox worked. The electric winch was full of water. I had the motor rewound for $100 and now it works fine. The heads were blocked, but worked when cleared. Later, I found out the main problem was a blocked vent, which pressurised the holding tank. The wheel steering was stiff, caused by the cable coming off the pulleys. Realign the pulleys. The main hatch one could lift off, making the padlock redundant rebuild the hatch runners. The decks leaked in places, and still do in places. The freshwater pump was not connected, and the supply pipe had dropped into the bilge water. Fit a new pipe and install the PAR pump with a knee switch to operate. The starboard saloon window leaked, and the duct tape cure no longer worked. Remove the old duct tape, a big job, and rebed the windows. The starboard jib sheet track leaked, and covered in duct tape as an ineffective cure. Tighten the track bolts. The inside was filthy. Took a week on and off to wash down all the surfaces with bleach and liquid detergent. The good points were the excellent 16 horse beater engine and stern gear. The fully batten main and Genua were almost new, made in Taiwan. Sylvia G came with a good Raymarine ST6002 autopilot to which I added an S100 remote control, a most useful addition when single-handed. A Lawrence GPS map with US charts and a built-in echo sounder. A Furuno radar, an excellent Ritchie compass and two VHF radios. Well equipped, considering the boat only cost me a little over $4,000 or £2,600, plus a few weeks' work. I bought a Verizon Jetpack 4G broadband hotspot to get online with my old laptop, which gave me access to the Active Captain website for a wealth of up-to-date information on marinas, anchorages and hazards, and also tide tables. Verizon gave me a connection everywhere.
though a bit slow in the remote parts of Georgia. Tidal ranges were small, typically three feet or so in the north and less than a foot in the south, so no help if you ran aground at speed. Towboat US do an excellent job, for a fee, helping those in trouble. Charts are available for a free download from NOAA and the US has an admirable policy that information produced by a government funded organisation is free to the taxpayer. You pay extra for publications like chart books but that is only fair. I found Skipper Bob's pilot on anchorages and bridges most useful and the waterways pilot gave a wealth of local information and places of interest. Weather forecasts are available continuously on VHF channels WX1 to 7, where computer voices read the typed information and broadcast it 24-7. A brilliant use of modern technology. Now for the official National Weather Service forecast for the Miami and Fort Lauderdale listening area. Tornado watch 282 in effect until 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time this morning. Another great idea is VHF Channel 26 to call up for a radio check. If you are transmitting OK, you hear your own voice received back. The course of the intercoastal waterway is marked on the excellent charts with a magenta line and buoyage is good. Heading south to port are odd-numbered green cans or square top marks and even-numbered red conical nuns or triangular top marks to starboard. Marks on the ICW also have little yellow squares and triangles on the port and starboard sides heading south, whatever the shape and colour of the top mark, but they are difficult to see at a distance. Voyage up rivers and into harbours is always red right returning and green to port, the opposite to the rest of the world. Typically the canal is 100 foot wide by 10 foot deep and the dredged material is dumped nearby to form spoil islands which over time have formed nice little desert islands popular with boaters and fishermen. It is a bit strange to motor close past fishermen standing up to their knees in a vast expanse of water. Lit marks are rare and often mark changes in the direction of the channel. I rarely travelled in the dark. Shallows are common near inlets from the Atlantic such as here at Baker's Hallover Inlet, Florida, seen clearly by satellite. We ran aground and had to nudge around to find five feet of water, watched by people relaxing on the sandbar a few feet away. Skippers help by updating their experience on active captain for others to follow. Railway bridges are normally open till a train comes along. There are sometimes places to tie up while you wait, but normally you have to jill around and wait. Bascule or swing opening bridges are held on VHF to request an opening. Some open every half hour and some on request. Some remain closed during rush hours. Some break down and don't open for a long time. Fixed road bridges are 62 to 65 foot clear at high water. The sole exception being the Tuttle Causeway Bridge in Miami at 55 feet. Tides can run strongly in rivers, but especially in man-made cuts between large bodies of water, seven knots in some places. Sailing in snow's cut between Carolina Beach and the Cape Fear River, I had the distinct impression that we were going downhill. I have been asked, how do you know where to go each day when you have never been there before? It's not always easy to find a sheltered anchorage out of the canal with enough depth. Sailing single-handed in shallow waters makes it difficult to leave the helm for long, so most planning is done the night before. First, check the weather forecast. Is it safe to travel and is the wind direction favourable or against? 
Most days it was not favourable and shelter from strong winds required at night. Ten hours of daylight multiplied by the estimated speed based on the forecast wind speed and direction gives the approximate distance that can be covered in a day. Then can we anchor out or is a marina required for fuel and supplies? Are the bridge opening times to be allowed for? Check the charts, pilot books and active captain online for suitable places the estimated distance ahead. One or two sites would be noted in the day log together with times of high and low water and a brief summary of the weather forecast. A few days after my winning bid I also won the eBay auction for an Avon inflatable dinghy and another auction for a five horsepower Nissan outboard both in as new condition for about $350 each. The first Saturday I hired a car and did a 400 mile round trip to pick them up while viewing the beautiful New England countryside dressed in autumn colours. I blessed the invention of GPS navigation again. On the 14th of October I had a shakedown sail heading for Mystic, the next river north, but never got there. The lever to engage the wheel pilot kept popping out and the furling drum jammed so I returned to sort it out. Hurricane Raphael had just become a Category 1 hurricane and heading north I felt that I had plenty of options for shelter if he came this far north so still prepared to head south. Set off on Tuesday the 16th of October with the forecast 15 to 20 knots northwest off the land and sheltered as I headed southwest down the Long Island Sound. Waves predicted two to four feet. By 8 a.m. we had left the Thames River and made reasonable progress in the Sound till the tide turned. Soon the waves were four foot and steep and we were close hauled on starboard and making very slow progress. I decided to head inshore for shelter and the only other yacht out there did the same. By 10 a.m. at about the fifth try I picked up a boy off the Neantic Bay Yacht Club and went below to lick my wounds as we sheared about and heeled to the gusts. Not much shelter. Lesson 1. Beating into 20 to 25 knots is not her strong suit. That was the end of strong winds for a couple of days, sailing up the sound, to be replaced by some fog. Raphael curved northeast into the Atlantic, as self-respecting hurricanes should. Rained all day going to Flushing Meadow, with a fresh easterly. Flushing Meadow. Pretty noisy with LaGuardia Airport next door and a busy freeway behind. Worse was the mile walk to the Loos. Helped a jolly bunch get their dragon boats ashore for the winter and amazed at how little fouling they had after a season afloat. Next day required careful timing to get through the notorious Hell Gate and this slack the, high water. Uh, famous Hell Gate in the East River, where the East River joins the Harlem River over there. And the tides here can run at four knots, so it's important to pick it at slack water. And there's Manhattan. And stories of whirlpools swallowing boats and ripping tides abound. Hmm. Slack water at Hellgate is 1 hour 45 minutes after high or low water at the Battery, which is the southern tip of Manhattan Island, but just four miles away. High water and slack water don't coincide, so we were bucking the tide for the last hour getting to Hellgate for slack high water. Very strange tides. Anyway, it's the tidal watershed area for the Long Island Sound and New York Harbour, a bit like the Swale. So once we were through Hell Gate, we had the tide with us all down the East River, 
waving to New Yorkers having their lunch break, the Empire State Building, Wall Street, the Seaport Museum, the Statue of Liberty in the distance, the huge Verrazano Narrows Bridge, 215 feet clear, before tucking into Sheep's Head Bay behind Coney Island to pick up a mooring for the night. Having worked the tide so well the day before, I left at low water to take the flood down the coast, but instead bucked the tide for hours, couldn't work it out. Anyway, had a nice fetch down the Atlantic to Manasqua Inlet and refuelled at Hoffman's Marina. I wanted a shower and a visit to the Chandlers, so paid the $90 for the night. Big mistake. The Chandlers had shut early, no one in the office to give me the code for the door to the showers, and a terrible berth that had me up all night fending her off as the tide and Parsic traffic smashed us into the piles. Very pleased to get away at first light. A lot of tyre noise. I've got my plank in operation. Next port was the gambling flesh pot of Atlantic City. Here I tried to get into a recommended anchorage and ran aground twice. The second time I was lucky to be pulled off by a passing motorboat with the tide now falling and towboat US hovering for a $300 fee to do the same job. I think the guide is mainly for motorboats and not deeper draft vessels. Spent a very peaceful night at anchor in the main harbour, well lit by the garish casinos. Sandy has intensified to hurricane status in the Caribbean. Still time to get to Cape May and then get out of the way. A long beat down the Atlantic the next day in fine weather, then into the splendid harbour of Cape May. At last a decent marina and shops and stores to tackle a few jobs. The steering needed adjustment and the autopilot had stopped working. The sliders on the main were jamming in the gate. The water pump had stopped pumping. I needed two more dock lines and fenders. I also needed to keep track of Sandy. I allowed two days for repairs and hired a bike to get to the supermarket for groceries. After two days, Sandy was a worry. It was huge. Still only a Category 1, but 800 miles wide and projected to track up the coast. At my pace of 50 miles a day, I could not get clear, so where should I shelter? The next marina was two days away up the Delaware, and isolated, and after that it was Annapolis, another two days away. The winds were already building, so I decided to stay at Uchis Marina, Cape May, and let Sandy pass there. The next forecast was not good. Most of the weather models predicted Sandy to come onshore instead of curving northeast out into the Atlantic. She had also increased to a thousand miles wide, 90 mile an hour winds and 10 to 12 foot storm surge. It was time to batten down and prepare for the worst. The marina was flat out pulling boats out. They had no keelboat cradles, so we were stuck in the water. I was worried about the strength of the cleats, so rigged the main sheet as a strop right round the counter and looped over the winches. Stone lines were then taken from the strop on each quarter. The main anchor warp was taken from the mast as the weather bow line, and the kedge warp strung from the mast to the opposite pontoon abeam to starboard to hold her off the pontoon to port. Every other line was used to double and treble up. The outboard was removed from the push pit and stowed in the forepeak along with the life ring. The rolled up jenny and mainsail cover had more lash lashings. She was trussed up like a turkey. The storm surge was my main worry. Too much and the pontoons would go over the top of the post and the marina would float away. We would be attached to the shore in our berth, but free floating pontoons and boats could smash us to pieces. On Saturday the surge was predicted at two foot 
in the morning high water and three foot in the evening high water. So at the morning high water I cut a notch in my post and indeed the evening high water was about a foot higher. This left about nine foot of post above. On Sunday the surge predictions of seven foot and eight foot again matched my measurements. So I felt confident a 10 foot surge could be handled but a 12 foot surge could be a disaster. I rehearsed my evacuation plan and packed my bag with a checklist and then realised I would have to leave early as at high water the ramps down to the pontoons were way up in the air and difficult to access. Winds were now making walking difficult and heavy rain. Forecast now was for the eye to come on shore 80 miles north of us, putting us at least in the right quadrant. Winds north, east, going north, then west, then south. Monday the 29th. Woke at 3.30 a.m. and wondered what was wrong. The boat wasn't bucking around so much as the wind had gone north and on the nose and not a beam. Up and down all night checking lines. Raining now at one inch an hour. Haiti had 20 inches of rain in 24 hours. Forecast now west 50 to 60 knots, gusting 75 knots, going southwest 40 to 50 knots. Storm surge 9 feet. High water 2034. Sandy now 350 miles diameter as a Category 1 hurricane and a thousand miles across as a tropical storm. Media billing here as a Frankenstorm and storm of the century. Three other crews joined me in the Ritz and we watched our boats in the marina in the comfort from behind double glazing. At 5 p.m. NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, gave the centre of Sandy 30 miles east-southeast of Cape May, travelling west-northwest at 28 miles an hour. I read that forecast at 6 p.m and wondered why the wind had dropped. We were in the eye. Of interest, 940 millibars was the lowest Sandy reached in her life cycle, which matched the forecast that she would intensify as she reached land, the opposite of normal, a very unusual hurricane. Sadly, the well-found replica of HMS Bounty was lost that night, not far from us, and her skipper and a lady crew drowned. We took it in turns to don full oilies and ventured out into the teeming rain to check on the boats. But the forces were too great to do anything, even if we found a problem. It took two of us to open and shut the door. Very dangerous to get onto a pontoon and suicidal to try and get on board. About 18 inches of post left at high water. Dozed on the floor of the Ritz until 4 a.m and I was to get on, able to get on board and pump the bilge and turn in. Tuesday morning, still storm conditions. The centre of the eye passed 10 miles north of us. Much damage and flooding. Eight inches of rain yesterday. 90 mile an hour gusts. I checked my emails and the news. Amazingly, Verizon Wi-Fi still working. Cape May was isolated by the authorities to stop looting and to clear the roads for emergency services. I therefore had a few messages from boat owners asking me to check on their boats. They had found my blog on Google giving an on-site account from the marina. I was happy to report no damage, a credit to the marina staff. In the end, Sandy cost me 12 days and a thousand dollars in Cape May, though it was a nice friendly place to be stuck. There was a small weather window to get up the Delaware Bay, but it turned out to be the worst day of the holiday. Left Cape May at 5 a.m. in a calm, but the wind soon came on the nose and freshened. The bay is shallow and cuts up rough and nowhere to shelter. After 12 hours beating, I was wet and chilled to the bone. Too rough for the autopilot, the steering had a lot of slack and no room to heave to. 
I started to make the classic dangerous mistake to attempt to get to shelter through unknown shallow water after a hurricane had churned up the sandbars and in three foot waves. I realized my error and stopped myself and turned and nosed into a sandbar in the middle of the bay and anchored for a few hours. I made a hot drink, the first in 12 hours, and rested as she leapt about. About 10 p.m. the wind had eased with the turn of the tide and we set off again. After a scare with a pusher tug nearly running me down, I anchored beside the channel at 4 a.m., a long day. Up at 7 a.m. and tackled the steering problem. The cable had come off the pulley and the quadrant, amazed it steered at all. Spent the morning fixing it, then set off into the Chesapeake and Delaware Bay Canal and the forecast was north 25 knots that afternoon. Shelter at last. Out into the pretty Chesapeake Bay and enjoyed the free wind and good tide giving us over eight, eight knots over the ground. Anchored at last light in a little bay with big ships passing in the channel nearby. Very cold, but a nice sunny day. Next day made it to Annapolis, passing under the huge Bay Bridge, the fourth longest in the world, and was then picked up by a friend to spend the veteran weekend with them in Washington, a very welcome break. Went to Arlington Cemetery on what we call Remembrance Sunday. They are burying their soldiers from Afghanistan every single day, very moving. Took my host for an evening meal and was amazed to see packs of women hunting men. Apparently there is a great shortage of straight men there. Another world. Set off from Annapolis trying to beat the weather but got smacked on the nose again late morning, so headed for shelter. Not an easy choice as it was due to blow a gale from south, then west, then north. But I found a real hurricane hole in over 20 foot of water most unusually deep. After two days I moved south to St Michael's, a lovely old village and home to the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum, well worth a visit. A bit like the Chippy School in Lowestoft, keeping the old shipwright skills alive. Another two days getting down the Chesapeake was livened one morning by my biggest fright yet. I had just left the Patuxent River, steering seated to Leward. It had been blowing north something 10 to 30 knots for days and heading south had been lumpy, but manageable, but too much for the autopilot. As I joined the Chesapeake Bay, it was pretty cold and had started to sleet. Doing six miles an hour with just half a jenny out, we were reaching out to round a shoal off the airbase before we could hang a right and run down the Chesapeake Bay. I was horrified to look up and see a freak wave way above my head about to hit us. Sylvia rose and rolled, burying her lee rail up to the coach roof. I was only saved from doing a backward somersault over the side by my left foot hooking under the wheel. I was wearing my life jacket but not my lifeline. In the past, I've been dragged overboard at five knots and it is impossible to pull yourself in till the boat stops. Eventually sailed into Norfolk, Virginia, past the awesome US Navy lined up for over a mile, blowing north 20 knots all day and more forecast, so pleased to get into the start of the ICW and shelter. Anchored for the night in Hospital Bay in the middle of town. Next morning I popped into a marina for some fuel and to pump out the holding tank. Unknown to me, the vent for the tank was blocked and as the guy opened the deck fitting, a gout of sewage shot all over him. Very embarrassing. He was very philosophical about it and very polite. By noon I was in the great dismal swamp canal, dug by slaves in the 1800s. About seven foot deep, dead straight, save for one bend. Stayed a couple of nights in the visitor's centre 
and met two other transients there who became great friends. Hired a bike the next day and cycled 14 miles through the national park, the only visitor there. No wildlife, but lots of trees and dead straight tracks. Worth the experience, but a sore bum. Next day, we locked out of the canal into the upper reaches of the Pesco tank. Very twisty and swampy. Lovely sailing. Best part of the dismal swamp. Went through a typical railway bridge. It is normally open till a train is due and has piles to tie up to and wait while the bridge is closed. Arrived at Elizabeth City about noon and tied up at the Freetown dock next to my new friends. Spent three days there while a storm blew over the Albemarle Sound. The next day was special and six transient crews all got together on a 40-footer for my first Thanksgiving. Turkey and all the trimmings and pumpkin pie. Just lovely. I said a grace by Robbie Burns with a translation. Elizabeth City had the well-earned reputation for hospitality. Left Elizabeth City in a flat calm with fog ashore and everyone making use of the weather window. The Albemarle Sound and the Alligator River are very shallow and cut up rough in a bit of wind and the Alligator River Bridge doesn't open in strong winds. Actually, it didn't even open in a flat calm for us as it broke down and we had to wait. Two branches of the intercoastal waterway meet at the entrance of the Alligator River, which is a bit like the entrance to the Twizzle from Hanford Water, shallow and twisty. Sod's Law, as we approached the tricky bit, fog came down. I fired up the radar and slowed to two knots. The motorboats behind slowed as well and followed me in. They said, let the deeper draft boat find the shallows. Found the marks, but very cautious in case Sandy had moved the shoals. The chart showed nine foot in the channel and six inches the other side of the buoy. Eyes glued to radar, sounder and plotter. We crept through and after a while emerged into the sunlight with a queue of boats behind. Perhaps they thought I knew the way. Next day we went through the Alligator Pongo River Canal and then anchored in a creek for the coldest night yet. Thick frost on decks in the morning made getting the anchor up a slippery, chilly job. A beautiful sunny day though, with light winds in the right direction. Not only do Americas drive on the wrong side, their channels are marked on the wrong side too. Red right in. This was a day of down the Pungui, boys red left, green right, then up the Pamlico, red right, green left, up Goose Creek, red right, green left, through the Hoboken Canal into Gale Creek, and down the Bay River, red left, green right, then up the News River, red right, green left. Yeah, I'm still in 17 feet of water, but it's really, really tight. Uh, I hate to do it at night because that's the only lit one. And uh, there's the track, and then there's somebody else coming behind, and I'm uh, refueling as well at the same time, putting another five gallons in. But um, wow, you've really got to keep your wits about you on this uh, stretch of the cruise. Um, yeah, that's 18 feet of water, but literally just there, just a few feet away, is one foot of water. And over there is about two foot of water. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. Right, now I've got to concentrate. We're at um, Hoboken now, Hoboken Cut, and uh, got some fishing boats here. Just been under the uh, been under the road bridge, and uh, passing the fishing boats. I wasn't expecting them to be here. They're quite big. 
quite a big coach. Pretty gone. Divine mercy. Yep, I think you need that sometimes. Oh, a couple of duck hunters. Seafood, processing, Mr. R. E. Mayo, Marine Supply. down this way. So depth 19 feet. Oh that's alright. A couple more to starboard. Tricky bit coming up. Oh, that's all right. uh, when we get out of the canal, apparently there's only a foot of water each side of the channel again. Pretty much the same as when we came in. Gale Creek. All right. Let's watch out for that. Keep my wits about me. Lovely wooded shores. Bet there's some game in there. Yeah. So there we are. That's the bridge over to Hoboken. Which is pretty much a dead end. It goes nowhere after that. In marshy land. A few reeds. A lot of sunshine. Lovely part of the world. Lovely. Then into Broad Creek to a marina so new the entrance was not on the charts and position uncertain. Not surprisingly, my friends didn't overtake me and let me make the mistakes. As it turned out, they ran aground twice. Very shallow outside the channel, one or two feet over large areas. The marina turned out to be very luxurious. The first time I've had a shower with steam jets built in for a personal sauna. Lovely people, lovely clubhouse, pool, complimentary SUV car and bikes and so on for the lowest rate of a dollar a foot a night. I stayed at the River Dunes Harbour Club and Marina for five nights while planning the last stage of my holiday, choosing and booking a yard to lay the boat up for the winter, booking flights home, booking a car, writing mag magazine articles, updating my blog and dealing with boat insurance that wanted more money because I didn't own a home in the US and had a foreign driving license. Why that should affect boat insurance is a mystery to me. We shopped in Oriental, five of us in the Marina SUV and had a memorable time in the marine consignment store which is called in Cape Town Yacht Grot. 
and Aladdin's cave of second-hand yachting gear. I bought 130 foot of 18 millimeter line and chain for $40. Then on to West Chandler's where I bought some foul weather gear as mine was now definitely not waterproof. A gentle sail brought us to Moorhead City on the coast where I fueled up and dosed the diesel with anti-bug mooty and pumped out the holding tank ready for laying up. Then a couple of days easy sailing to Hampstead, North Carolina, where she was hauled out. Uh, 15 feet, 16 feet of water. Over there is Lejeune uh, military camp. Uh, signs up saying, when red light flashes, stop because you're in, uh, they're firing live rounds at the range. And a sign back there saying, don't go ashore here, there's live ordnance. Um, there's the inlet still over there, Bogue Inlet in the distance. Uh, but this is pretty typical into coastal waterway canal. Pam and Gerald, the owners, were really helpful and lent me a truck to buy tarpaulins, lines and bungee to cover her up and even drove me to the airport to catch the first of three flights to get home. I will be going back in April to continue the adventure for a three month visa and then probably sell her on eBay. As someone said, she doesn't owe me much and I could possibly put a sign on her saying, thanks for a great time, free to anybody and walk away.